Welcome to All Things AI. My name is Ishan, and in the second episode, we have Rohan Kalasdi, the founder of Vital, which leverages deep learning techniques for the assessment of neurodegenerative diseases. In addition, Rohan is a student researcher at Harvard University, and he won third place at the International Science and Engineering Fair this year. Welcome to the channel, and it's awesome to have you here today. Yeah, thank you for having me. So first, I'd like to just get into your journey in AI. So where did your passion all start? Yeah, so before getting interested in AI, I was definitely more interested in the biological sciences, specifically neuroscience. And neuroscience has a lot of overlap with AI, like at least at a high level, right? So I think it was around eighth grade when I started to learn about how artificial intelligence worked and kind of the different you know things we could do with AI. So that's kind of how I first got interested in artificial intelligence. And then from there, I kind of just learned how to code. And then I took a bunch of courses on Coursera. And then after Coursera, like those like deep learning AI courses, I really just jumped right into sort of project-based learning. So I kind of went head first into projects. And I think sort of doing that was what really allowed me to grow my skills very, very quickly. Because in project-based learning, like you're kind of forced to just like learn on your feet. And I think that's a lot better than following like tutorials on YouTube, for instance, because a lot of times it's very, it's, it's very passive when you're learning on YouTube, right? Like you're kind of just copying down the code and, you know, trying to understand it. But yeah, that was kind of how I got interested in AI and then how I built my skills. So the project, like I'd say pushes you in a way to, um, cause you have to like think about it on your own. It's not like you're taking somebody else's trying to learn from it. And then like, especially if there's like a deadline for like a science fair or something, I think that's what really, for example, that pushed me last year to um, actually like get everything done on time. Yeah, I agree with that. The other good thing about project-based learning is that you're kind of forced to come up with ideas, like ideas by yourself on new techniques that you can implement or like new um, applications, right? And that's something that you kind of build over time. So the earlier you start to kind of build that ideating skill set, the better. And so over the years, what do you think you enjoy most about working in AI? So my interest in AI have also kind of like shifted over time. I think originally I was pretty interested in like the whole like medical AI field and I'm still very interested in that now. Like I have a startup in that field, but that was kind of how I started off all of my projects. Um, but the issue with a lot of medical AI projects is that as a high schooler, you're limited to data that you, that you can find online. Like it's very hard for you to find a trial to, to do yourself and get data from, right? So. And all the data that you find online has definitely been overused, right? Like there's definitely like 10, 20 papers on each existing data set. So to be honest, I kind of got bored of just doing like research using those online data sets because it's really hard to do something that's truly novel. Sure, you can maybe get like a one, 2% accuracy boost on whatever the state of the art on that data set is by implementing, you know, whatever current state of the art model is. But in my opinion, that's not real research, right? That's just implementing that you found online. So I kind of stepped away from that. And the way I kind of stepped away from that was I started doing an internship at MIT. And specifically, specifically it was at the um, Center for Brains, Minds, and Machines. So a lot of the work that they do at the brain, at that lab, is they try to use AI to essentially learn about the brain. And this sort of called my, you know, past interest in neuroscience. So that was kind of a really good fit for me. Um, and that actually led to me creating my ISA project and also my true interest in AI. And so what my true interest in AI is right now is actually trying to use neuroscientific principles to create better artificial intelligence systems. And I think about the medical field, it's like, yeah, there's like 10, 20 papers. And that's like one of the things I see as a problem because not only is it hard to find novelty, but there's so much going on in the medical field. But I think AI, obviously, like like you found your niche and like, um, like the brain, for example, with uh, correlating that with AI. But I think it really varies. Like there's so many other areas that we are yet to do something big in. And so, for example, like social justice and things like that can also be um, definitely influenced through AI. And I think... That's like, for example, next year science fair, I think that's what I'll be more interested in because the medical, everything looks the same. It's like, in when you look at it from like a holistic view, so it's like, 
if I really want to do something new, I think what I, where I want to go with that would probably be in like doing something that's social justice because that would be unique, innovative, and helpful all at the same time. Yeah, I agree with that. And the issue with medical AI is not just that everything is kind of like the same project, but it's also that most medical AI systems that you train on data sets do not work at all in real life. And, you know, there's so many big companies that have struggled that have struggled with the same issue. Like probably the best example is Google, right? Like Google um, got a lot of AI for diagnosing eye diseases using retinal images. And when they actually put like um, their systems into the real world, they found that their algorithms really couldn't perform accurately because there was, for example, like very small changes in lighting conditions that completely threw the model like off of its um, performance, right? So there's just a lot of those type of issues that really make the medical AI field very difficult to actually create something that has actual value. Yeah, no, and it's because it, you're like, it's like a patient's life at risk. You can't just do like, yeah. oh, hey, we'll do this with the model. That's what the data is for. So definitely agree on that. But next, um, obviously more substantially and probably the most important part, I want to get into vital. So um, you've been doing this for, I believe, about two years now. Uh, many students on the project and you wrote some papers and now I think you guys are planning on releasing an app, right? Yeah. So um, what do you do in like, for example, like over the summer, obviously it's probably one of the main times, especially as a high school student that you get a real chance to look into it. So what do you think, or I guess, how have you been, what, what's what been going on recently? I mean. Yeah. So as you said, I started Vital around two years ago. Um, I co-founded it with my friend Sai. We were both sophomores at the time, and we really just found it vital because we were both pretty interested in the neurology space and the AI space, and we kind of wanted to just build a cool project together that was sort of at the intersection of those two spaces, but it kind of grew into a lot more than a project over time. So to give a little like spiel about what we're building is, we're essentially building a way to evaluate your brain health in 30 seconds using a smartphone. And the way we're doing this is we're taking advantage of um, ocular movement biometrics. So to give some background, there's like over 20,000 papers that have linked changes in your eye movements to a bunch of different neurodegenerative conditions. This includes like Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, right? They all have very early onset changes in eye movements. So our thinking was, hey, if we could detect these um, changes in ocular eye movements very early, we could have a democratized screening tool for all of these different diseases. So, you know, after looking into the space a little bit, we found that there's actually, again, there's a lot of research on those ocular biometrics, but the issue is that to actually calculate those biometrics, you need pairs of eye tracking headsets, which are like $4,000, like, yeah. or like a decent pair, right? So that was the main hurdle that was stopping doctors and neurologists from actually taking advantage of ocular biometrics in their daily practices. So basically what we're building at Vital now is just a way to calculate all of those same ocular biometrics using either a smartphone or a laptop. And so in that process, is there like any problem as far as accuracy would go or because it's obviously a smartphone camera is nowhere close to like eye tracker or something like that. Yeah. So this is really the perfect time for applications that use laptop or smartphone eye tracking to work. Um, really the front facing cameras, although they're still not great, they've become good enough to do fairly accurate eye tracking post calibration. So essentially the, what we do at Vital is we're training these eye tracking systems um, using artificial intelligence, but even after they're trained, you as the user has to go through a two to three minute calibration process, which essentially tailors your eye tracker to your face and your features, right? So you're essentially getting your own gaze tracking model that's personalized to you. And that's how we're able to get accuracies that rival those expensive headsets. So next, I think you guys have been getting a lot of funding recently, right? Yeah, so we've kind of, spent this whole summer trying to raise funding. Um, raising funding is an incredibly difficult thing to do. Yeah. It's not even difficult, really. Difficult is the wrong word. It's time consuming. It takes a lot of outreach, right? 
if you're not well connected in the space to start out with, really the only thing you can do is number one, try to build your network, like reach out to other startup founders to see if they can give you maybe a warm, like a warm introduction, or again, just like cold emailing different venture capital firms. But we've had some luck recently with finding VCs that were interested in investing. So our first investor was Powerhouse Ventures. Um, they essentially finished up our pre-seed round for us. And then our seed round was mainly pushed by a VC called um, Diamond Investments. So Diamond Investments was a, is an, it's a VC based in India and they were just recently announced. So we kind of caught them at a very early stage in their development. And they were actually willing to be one of our, or essentially have us be one of their first investments for their firm. So they've agreed to um, invest $1 million at a $12.5 million valuation. And we might raise a little bit more. We want to raise around $1.2 million. So we're probably going to round out the round there with another VC. Um, but yeah, that's kind of where we are now. Oh, and then I forgot to mention in our pre-seed round, there's another VC called um, Zolon Ventures that also helped us out, you know, like rounding out that round completely. And so obviously there's a lot of possibilities with what you've been getting recently. So what do you plan to put that funding towards? Yeah. So trials are incredibly expensive. That's, to be honest, that's where most of the money is going to go. Um, we already have a couple of trial sites set up. One of them is with a local elderly home. And we're probably just going to do a trial there to, number one, test how easy our application is to use, right? Our intended population is sort of the elderly people who are more at risk for these conditions, right? So we want to make sure that our product is actually usable for them. And then, yeah, so basically all the money is going to go towards doing those trials. Um, maybe if we go down the line, we'll discuss salary. One of the great things about sort of building as a high schooler is that you don't exactly need a salary because you live at home, right? So no one has a need to actually be getting paid right now. Um, and for a lot of people, it's kind of just an extracurricular, right? So the experience. Yeah, yeah, it's for the experience, right? So we haven't had a need to pay salaries right now, but we probably will end up later on. Yeah, makes sense. And I think definitely like the trials and everything, because it's very burdening if you had to take that all on yourself in, the, in any occasion. So the funding is definitely going to, yeah. I hope you um, help in a um, sense with that. But next, I actually want to take a step back and actually come back to the app. So, um, what are, so once you obviously design it and assure, what would it look like when you try to implement it in a real life situation, like app store or something like that? Yeah. So to give some like clarifying information, we're building out two apps that are simultaneously. We have one that's implemented on a laptop one that's implemented on a smartphone, they're the exact same process and they should get the exact same biometric data, but it's just easier for us to do some initial testing on the laptop so we can actually make sure that um, it works properly. We, we've done some preliminary testing that has shown that it does work properly, but first we want to sort of set it up on a laptop so we can kind of distribute it to a number of clinics. But essentially how the app works is when you download the app as a patient, what your walk through is first a calibration. So, you know, it's about two to three minutes of calibration. You'll be able to see how accurate your gaze tracker is at the end of the calibration process. If it's, you know, not accurate enough, then you need to do another calibration round. And, but essentially you should have a, an eye tracker or gaze tracker that's good enough for you within that three minute time span. But after you finish that calibration process, you are walked through a number of very simple gaze tracking tests. So these tests are very, very easy for anyone to really follow. One might be, hey, track this dot that's moving in a circle around the screen. Another one might be track the dot that's jumping ar around the screen, right? These are very simple tasks, very easy to follow. But throughout these around 30 seconds of tasks, what your computer is doing is it's taking pictures of your face and using our AI algorithm for gaze tracking, we can calculate thousands of gaze points. So what's happening in the back end of the app 
is we're actually calculating those same biometrics that you would otherwise only be able to calculate using those aforementioned very expensive headsets, right? So that's kind of how the app works. And obviously we store your biometric values so you can kind of see whether your symptoms are declining or um, improving, right? Is, yeah, is, it like, is it like real-time processing or how does that work? Like, is there a time to get back? How does that, once like the user goes through all the tests? The gaze tracking is very, very instantaneous because our model is very, very lightweight. Um, we've kind of taken care to do that. But for the actual like biometric calculation process, it might take one to two minutes. Okay. But it is effectively real time. Yeah. It's one to two minutes is basically nothing in that sense. Um uh, finally about vital. So again, like touching back on the point you started this two years ago, I'm sure, or at least uh, that there have been some struggles along the way, right? For example, like finding people to work on the project. And so do you want to get a bit into what that was in the beginning or even now? Yeah, yeah, of course. So I was lucky enough to kind of find myself in a friend group where everyone was super, super talented in ways that I wasn't. So working with those people kind of really rounded out the team in a way that really made us, you know, one cohesive, like cohesive structure. Um, and actually we started out vital, not trying to do this eye tracking stuff at all. We actually started off trying to do um, EEG based diagnostics. So, you know, like using one of those EEG headsets, um, you, you know, just like trying to diagnose various diseases using that EEG data. Um, we wanted to do this because there's a lot of existing data sets that um, were out there like on open neuro, but they haven't really been played around with too much. So after we did that for a certain amount of time, we just kept on running into issues. So we that's when we did the pivot towards using this, um, or going down this eye tracking, eye biometric route. And the reason why we went down this eye biometric route was because me and my other friend, his name is Sriton, we did work at the Harvard Ophthalmology AI Lab. And we were actually thinking about this project while working with the people at Harvard. And they were actually sort of able to, you know, look through our plans for the project and make sure that it was, you know, all feasible and all doable. So yeah, there's definitely been struggles along the way. Um, the other big struggle that we had besides that initial pivot that I, I talked about before was actually just raising money. Um, raising money is, we're first time founders, right? So we don't have a strong network in the startup space and having, a, having that strong network can really take you very, very far in the startup space. But the cool thing is that once you've kind of broken into the space, you have definitely already built up a big network. So if, you know, me or Sai, like if either of us try to start a new thing five years down the line, it's going to be a much easier process for both of you us. You have experience with everything. With exactly. This. Um, so next, just briefly, uh, mm -hmm. just getting into the lab research, um, what does that look like? Obviously at Harvard, probably amazing experience and it seems like they're very supportive, especially in terms of, I think you said they looked over um, some of the work you guys were doing, right? Yeah, so the PI of the lab is Dr. Els, the one that I work at. Um, and Dr. Els is actually an advisor for our startup. So he's definitely been great giving us advice. He's done a lot of work with, you know, it's like eye tracking technology, like in a clinical setting. So he has a lot of experience and knowledge about what exactly good eye tracking technology works like. Um, but the actual experience of working at the lab, I haven't actually been there in person. All of the work I've done is online with them. I've met the people in the lab in person one time. Um, we finished up like three abstracts for a conference a couple like months ago. Um, so we presented those three abstracts there and there I met, um, all of the, like the PI and the, um, postdocs that I was working closely with, but yeah, I mean, it's been a good experience. It's kind of interesting to see how actual research works at a lab. It's a lot more, um, I don't know what the word I'm looking for is like, it's a lot more well-defined, if that makes sense, than the work that we do as like independent researchers. I mean, it gives you, I guess, structure. Yeah. All right, so next, I just want to briefly touch on the current news in AI. So 
I think by far the biggest thing that we've seen in the past year is obviously OpenAI's ChatGPT and then Google also released their own chatbot. And then we're seeing that I'm pretty sure it's Apple recently might release a new one. And it's like, there's already been so much like, I guess, bad stuff in a way going around with these coupled with all the good effects. So especially in the younger generation, so high school and middle school students, and there's been uptake in the misuse, but these have only been out for a couple months. So what do you think like the long-term impact of large language models will be on high school students? Yeah. So obviously like the most immediate thing that high schoolers use GPT for is to like cheat on stuff. And that's not really that big of an issue in the first place because GPT makes the process of like cheating a lot faster. But again, if you really wanted some information, then you can just Google it. Obviously, like GPT writes for you. Half the time, the stuff that GPT outputs is really, really crappy. Like, I even write like something. Yeah. Like, a good example is um, like my English class at school. We had like a, a lot of kids get caught for using GPT. But the way the teacher caught them was noticing that the text was really, really weirdly written. Like it didn't actually make complete sense with what they were trying to do. Were so, they a bit similar, like each like person, because if they all use the same tool, it must have, even if they put in like different prompts out of it, like at least some similarities that you can notice in them, right? Yeah, I'm not even sure if it was a similarity. I think it was just the way that it was worded. Like it didn't sound very human in the way it was written. So, yeah. I mean, I don't think it's a great tool for writing actually, like in general. Um, so. But yeah, I feel like the big issue is that kids are just going to forget to learn how to think for themselves. And that's gonna have a lot of repercussions on the line, but there's a lot of ways that you can use GPT and these like associated tools to really do a lot of other cool things. Like there's so many like early college founded startups that leverage GPT-4 as the like core of what they do as a startup. And these startups have raised huge funding rounds, right? So again, that's just another place to do huge research and development in. So I think there's like a good and bad side to it. On one, it gives a lot of new opportunity for high schoolers and college students. But again, it really shouldn't be used as a way to like replace how you think, if that makes sense. I think how I like to look at it is if it's prohibited, don't do it. But I think in like the real life scenario, when you have the freedom, maybe like a tedious task, like if it's the most intellectual thing, first of all, I don't think it might, it's not, it's not even going to nail it like on the dot. Cause sometimes it does the same exact thing, even though you're like, this is a mistake and you even tell it it's a mistake. But I think, I think what really chat GPT like can be used for is like doing the tedious tasks for humans. Yeah, of course. Yeah. I agree with that. So lastly, just branching out of, I guess, still AI, but um, advice for high school and middle schoolers. So you're a rising senior now. Um, you got involved in AI pretty early on. I think you said it was freshman or eighth grade, right? Yeah, yeah. So, and then this is like one thing I noticed with myself too. In the beginning, it was always a struggle because like if I was trying to learn coding or something, there's so much to it. And then you have to learn the libraries and then the Coursera's. And it all seems like there's like a huge mountain that you're trying to like carry it's just discouraging, I guess, to say the least. So did you ever go through that? And then like, how did you get into AI research? Or if that ever happened, like, how did you overcome it? I think like, well, when I got into AI research, that was when like school closed because of COVID. So I kind of had like a crazy amount of free time at that time, because I was doing basically nothing at home. Like, so I had a lot of free time at the time to kind of do whatever I was interested in. And that just happened to be like one of the things I wanted to do. And I was lucky that I had that interest at that exact time because I had a lot of freedom. But really, I don't think it's super hard for really anyone to get into AI nowadays. Um, obviously, the first step is to learn how to code. If you don't. A lot of it now. So. Exactly. So, I mean, yeah, the first step is to just learn how to code, learn Python. There's a lot of great resources online. Um, the course on like Udemy are really good. That's how I learned. I took one. Um, and then for the actual like learning machine learning, those like deep learning AI courses are great. The Stanford ML course is great too, but it's really not a one size fits all thing. There's other options, you know, 
there's learning from like YouTube tutorials. There's learning from books. Um, books are a great option too. There's a lot of famous ones that you can go ahead and, you know, try out, maybe find like an online PDF for free. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of really, really different types of resources for learning AI. And I feel like anyone can find one that works for them if they really want to get into AI. The one trap I would say that a lot of high schoolers and middle schoolers fall into is like you can start out with those like Kaggle data set, like implement ML model <laughs> like projects. But what a lot of middle school and like mainly high school researchers do is they kind of just do a bunch of projects on those data sets. But that's kind of not how machine learning research is in the real world. Like that's a fine before you, like half the time, like you can like already find the code that people put up and it's like. Yeah. And I feel like going through those processes, like they build some experience, but they don't really build your problem solving skills and they don't build your creativity. You should really be trying to find a new application or a totally new project when um, going through project-based learning. Cause I feel like it's going to be a lot harder and it might feel a lot slower, but it's going to be super lucrative at the end. Um, and you'll definitely see the benefits. I think like going back, like, especially just data in general, um, that's the thing. Like if you do like a social impact project, like let's say, I think the second place that I think it was STS, uh, Regeneron this year, it was an ML project that focused on, I'm pretty sure um, some analysis of articles to see if it was humanizing, I'm pretty sure. And what I noticed is that, like, that's pretty innovative, like making your own data set. And there's so much medical data out there, but obviously it's not easy to get access to that if you're not like a PhD or somebody. So I think you can really like, I think that's one of the main things I think that I might even try this year is to like make my own data set. For example, like if you're like a security camera, like why don't you try analyzing something from that? But yeah, as far as creative, yeah, learning, like, yeah, that, that was a super interesting project. And actually, like, learning how to work with data that's not ready to be used with an ML model just yet, and that you actually have to sort of reform and work with and, you know, like, do a lot of things to actually get that data set ready. First off, that's, in the real world, that's 90% of the puzzle when it comes to building actually, you know, valuable AI models, right? Because in the real world, the data that you're going to get, you know, say you're working at a job, like at some firm, all the data that you're going to get is not automatically going to be ready to just like throw into an ML model, right? You're going to have to clean up the data a lot. And building those skills is just as important, if not more important, than learning how to sort of implement ML models, in my opinion. So if you can try to find a project where you can sort of build both of those skills, that would be ideal. All right, so finally, and this is like fully out of AI in a way and more just like words of wisdom. So you've gone through like three years of high school, middle school and everything. So I guess, what do you think is something that you wish somebody told you when you were starting off high school that I guess some, something you wish somebody told you that you thought was really helpful and that you'd like to tell somebody now? Yeah, probably the thing that I feel like people should follow in general, like throughout life is that you can do whatever you want. Just make sure you are very, very good at it, if that makes sense. Because there's this whole thing, or there was this whole thing about being very, very like well-rounded, like playing, you know, many different sports, which is fine. Like I used to play a lot of sports too, but I'm just saying like what a lot of people try to do is they try to do everything at once, but the outcome of that is always you're mediocre at everything. It's much better to do what you absolutely love to do, but do it very, very well. Because that's when, that's what allows you to build as high of a value for yourself, you know, like as a person in the workforce, right? Having like, yeah. The more specific and strong your skill set is, the more valuable you'll be. But yeah. um, I definitely agree on that basis because I feel like one thing, especially, um, because I used to like do so many things when I was younger and it was like fortunately I like let go of many of them and it was like it was hard for like the first couple of days I'm like oh no I'm not like fencing anymore or something but then over time it like kind of was like was I really interested in that like 
it feels that bad then but then it was really I think a learning experience but I think yeah as I got older like you need to prioritize some certain things and let go of others and because that's what I think yeah like you said really sets you apart from others yeah like I had a similar experience like in middle school I played soccer and lacrosse like they took a lot of time out of my week you know just like practices going to games all that and I like the sports but I didn't love them enough to really put in my all to them at all times right so after COVID started I kind of decided hey I might as well just do exactly what I like to do instead of trying to you know do all these different things at the same time but quarantine definitely opened up like huge yeah. like, opportunity for anybody that wanted to pursue something yeah yes with that being said thank you so much for your time it's great to have you here today yeah thank you and for anybody watching this make sure to leave a like subscribe and just stay updated for more videos